Sup everybody, this is Carrick with ACG, and guess what? As always, it's my continuing mission to bring you reviews that aren't two minutes long or filled with sponsored bullcrap. Today's game asks the question I think we've all asked ourselves. What happens when you mix Redwall and Age of Empires, but no one can develop past strapping explosives to their faces and headbutting the enemy? Well, my friends, that puts you solidly in tooth and tail territory, an RTS where the animals of the world all battle it out for the land rights, and possibly the rights to snack on one another when the occasion permits. I imagine a cannibalistic civil war would most likely be just like this, where everything pretty much revolves around meat. Let's see how it did, shall we? Tooth and Tail is out September 12th for $19.99 on Steam. As always, if you like the video, eh, maybe subscribe. So here's my review for Tooth and Tail. Cannibalistic Rats of Nim, Rock, Paper, Scissors, Homicidal Squirrel, and the awesomeness of stream sniping. Graphics are up first. I have to say there's a lot I really like about Tooth and Tail. It's like Redwall took a bath in glue and then rolled itself around in colored glass for about four hours. It's that 8-bit look, pixel art for some, and for many it's going to be something that really absolutely nails the look, and for others it's going to look tired and old and last, last, last generation. For me, it's a strange mix of both, because while I love the different creatures and styles with each army having their own large number of units that you can go into battle with, 20 total units and 6 chosen either by the story or at random if you're doing multiplayer, you know, I also love how everything really had a visual equivalent of onomatopoeia, snakes, poison, skunks, drop gas, and of course giant flamethrowing pigs, well, they pretty much burn everything in sight like they suddenly realize they have an entire section at their enemies' supermarkets. And while it is 8-bit, each offers a small tidbit of graphical information within the unit's animation, like the scuttling of little lizards with their tribal spears or the leaping frogs with high explosives wired to warty backs. But the game does hit a couple bumps. You see, it uses procedurally generated terrain, so each time you enter a battle, it's different. And I love that idea, and I have no problem with procedurally generated terrain. But sadly, when you mix that with 8-bit stylings of graphics, where there's some fairly tight art styles, when the tiles are placed down next to each other, it can be a little bit absurd to try to figure out where you can go, with you thinking, okay, I can pass through here, but a little itsy bitsy rock is holding me back, while the enemy just continues to destroy me. And there is a mini-map, and that does help a little bit, but I won't lie, there were a number of times where I looked at my leader and I thought, you know what, Truffle Hump Snurfer do has a strange affection for tree bark, and just wouldn't stop rubbing up against it as I tried to find an enemy's base. When it comes to performance, even when I had the split-screen multi going on, this thing is going to run on pretty much any kind of modern PC out there, and you're going to get a good hefty frame rate, and there were no issues technically that I could find with the game at all. So if you have something modern, you're in good shape. As a package, I'd say there's a great deal to like here in this game, and the variation of enemy units and the bits of telling animation from creature to creature nails the feel of animal-on-animal -animal war. But it does hit a couple missteps, not the least of which is that loss of visual information that you get in the landscape. Sound, music, and voice. And you know what, let's do voice first. Uh, there isn't a ton here, but what it does is it does something that many games can't seem to do well these days, and that's get more for less. And I also can't tell you if this is in Russian or some made up language, but it certainly feels like some of the tonal inflection is really rock solid. Or there's a singing chorus of what sounds like a bunch of farm animals, three sheets to the wind, singing patriotic songs about, well, begin, I'm not quite sure, but they thought it was important, and so did I by the time I was done. Now, whether you're in the story or you're commanding, sometimes there's a reaction to things, and sometimes the characters speak, and other times they don't. And for the most part, one or two sentences are spoken from the main characters or those introducing the new missions before it actually switches over to text, and that's all written quite well. Now, it's not amazing, but for what it's worth, its inclusion doesn't actually indicate it's poorly done, which shows a deft hand in understanding that if you're going to put resources into something, even if it's not something huge, if it's just something small, then don't add it just for a bullet point. Music. Now, this is actually surprisingly great, and I don't think a lot of us will be surprised, and I'll explain why. It has an old nomadic feel to it at times that also draws a good deal of inspiration due to its instrument choice of a Russian propaganda mixed with old tavern songs kind of feel. It's one part well-worn shoe and somehow one part call to arms that shows that once again, Austin Wintry and those folks who've joined him here knows how to deliver a soundtrack. It also has to be one of the most 
damn surprising soundtracks I think I can remember in a long time. One moment there's an old beat up piano playing in what sounds like the back of some tavern somewhere thrumming out tunes and the next woodwinds merge up with what sounds suspiciously like a mandolin. It's great stuff and due to the smart choice of theme and instrument it doesn't get old even if this is the 1000th time you've tried to beat the other three leaders in what feels like a you against the world deathmatch and suddenly out of nowhere an entire horn section looks around and goes oh crap we're supposed to be playing right now. Very good. It is eclectic sure and it's not a great deal of downtime here or there but overall I really liked it. Sound. You know this is pretty good but it does hit a couple missteps along the way especially with any game like this, there is that one unit, you know it, it's like the Leroy Jenkins and just always is first to battle. The lack of real variation means that it can get a bit crunchy when everyone sounds like they're attacking with the same spear while holding it in a studio somewhere. Luckily, with hit effects having their own sounds and being different depending overall, it's not bad. It's just that in some instances, it can be a bit hard to figure out who's getting hit by what because the game thinks that everyone sounds the same and the lack of that true dynamic feel to the attacks is a little bit noticeable from here to there. Now, that being said, the moment you start introducing the more powerful and thus less high in numbers enemies, the better it gets with turrets unleashing incredible rates of fire into your front lines and Porky the Pyromaniac showing up and doing his best impression of the bad guys in the movie The Crow and just yelling fire it up and making the world into bacon. As a package, it is still good, but it has a couple rough patches. And of course, that brings us to gameplay and a bit about the story. So basically, the animal world is in civil war. Now, this is because food shortages have resulted in all the animals switching to meat. And then the inevitable stranded island question comes up, which is, do you eat Bob or Susan? And how soon do you do it? One of the leader's kids is visiting a city and boom, the other animals eat him and thus war begins. With animal leaders drawing lines and creating factions like the civilized, who call themselves that but are pretty much anything but, or the KSR, militants with an attitude, and those are rounded out by two others, the long coats and the common folk. Now when you jump into Tooth and Tail, you have a story mode and multiplayer modes. Story mode has you jumping into the shoes of the various leaders, and I have to say, Bravo to these guys. At first, the locations can look a bit barren, but once you start walking around, there are hundreds of things to see and read and sort of interact with within the game world before you enter any missions. The lore of the game is delivered via these things, like family portraits or pissed off squirrels bent on revolution and drunk at your bar. It's fantastically done for an RTS, which usually I would say hinge on either in-game voiceovers or cutscenes, where for the most part, Tooth & Tail eschews that for a more elastic interpretation of storytelling. Now, once you talk to all of the drunk animals or angry prisoners or whatever else is in the area, you find a mission giver who tells you what's happening and sends you off. In the story, you're locked to whatever story units the game has for you as that leader. The easiest way to think of this is short, medium, long, and air units. But where the magic is in Tooth and Tail is the depth, despite it looking somewhat shallow. For instance, units heal in spaces where it makes sense. Lizards in water and things like moles and squirrels in more grassy areas or near their grist mills, which are the main source of income and which allow you to build bunkers for the various animals you want to spawn. For example, you might enter a battle with a flamethrowing wielding pig backed up by a high-flying falcon and reinforced by rifle-shooting foxes, while the next time you might be employing this world's most pissed-off giant lizard with a spiked club and with ground turrets. This is the juice in Tooth and Tail, variety. And just when you enter a battle and go, okay, I think I pretty much have a handle on this, maybe you're then tasked with saving another leader and then joining together, and that's when you sort of sit back and think, damn, how do I back up a legion of poisonous snakes with my geckos when the goal is for all of us to escape alive or capture the mills? And these mills, which basically are your farms, extend your range and also allow for you to make more food to buy more units. Their destruction isn't just felt in your pocket, but in your belly and in your control sphere. And speaking of control, this is dead easy and exactly the way it should be, whether it be keyboard and mouse or controller. Because you really have two types of control here, everybody or the one unit you've chosen. So controlling them and basically sending them somewhere just revolves around you as the leader running towards an enemy, getting close to them and hitting either the rally button where everybody rallies to it or the rally unit trigger or button where just that one unit runs to it. And it depends of course on the tit for tat that's going on there. And of course, if your troops die, new ones come from your nests, which you can destroy if you find out the army isn't set up right, but you can also destroy the enemies, which stops them from breeding them. And that is really the absolute beauty here. It is that tit for tat game where you're not quite sure what you're gonna enter into the battle with. And you might find out that only one enemy on the enemy's side is created there to really just be demise for your furry folk. And another where maybe the enemy's outfitted with an entire legion of troops that are all just best suited to roasting you over a pit. What's also surprising is the units are lore. Now, in many games, we would see Spearmen is just Spearmen. Here, they're named groups, little mini factions, which you also can find information about in the story proper. So the moment you see the glorious AFB and see gas mask wearing skunks, you may already know a bit about them, 
but regardless, they seem to matter more. And lastly, add to all this, there's unique elements like environmental bits. For example, sand can burn your characters in some levels if they're too far away from your mill, which adds some unique strategies and gamesmanship, really, when you try to think, hey, you know what, should I take over this grist mill and leave it fairly unprotected in the hopes that it'll draw an enemy out? And what I did like is that the size of the maps is just big enough to make pincer attacks and false retreats actually work, but not so big that it feels like you're filming a damn version of Chariots of Fire with animals as the stars. Now, that being said, there are a couple things I really did not like, and that's the mills mechanic itself. It became tiresome as while the missions always had little elements that were unique and sometimes you have heroic ways to win a level that didn't involve the age old traipse the hell around the entire place and destroy everyone mentality. The sad bit is that usually it did. And I get it. You want to win, you leave no one behind and use your main leader to strike out and scout the lands while you're starting your farm and stepping up its production all makes sense. But there's something about it that just felt fairly repetitive at times. What's interesting is despite my complaint on the flip side, it made some battles riveting because you might think, dude, I'm getting smoked here. But with intelligent sabotage of, say, an enemy's mills, you might destroy their food base. And even if you're leading the murderous trio of Alvin, Simon and Theodore, you can still actually win. And I did a couple times. Now, multiplayer, when you jump into it, is ranked, unranked, and local, with ranked being random, unranked being a lobby system so you can play with friends, and local being sitting on the same computer, just absolutely smoking people and basically local stream sniping folks left and right. Take that, PUBG. And I have to say, local is actually really fantastic. You can choose players or AI and then just sit down and battle. And of course, let's talk about AI and battle. Now, as you guys know, I test from the easiest difficulty where the best civilizations fall due to the leader getting a splinter, and the highest where it seems like everyone's staffed by a division of Alexander the Greats. And I have to say, this is actually incredibly good. Even on easy, the game takes advantage of your mistakes, but on ruthless? Well, let's just say prepare to go, what? As the enemy somehow seems to know everything you're doing a good four minutes before you've even loaded the damn multiplayer map. Now, in story mode, the game does do some strategic tomfoolery with specific elements to make the game harder in those levels. And while I won't say it cheated because that's what the story's about, there were times where I was thinking to myself, this is either Hannibal Barca leading these suckers or they have stores of meat somewhere that they're not telling me about. And of course, all this brings us to fun factor. You know, I think we can all agree a game like this needs to hinge on the various elements any RTS hinges on, which is rock, paper, scissors mentality with the wild card of leadership where the player comes in. And on every level, Tooth and Nail does meet that. And for that, I had an incredible time playing it. And the story lasts more than eight hours, while the multiplayer and skirmish modes can effectively be forever. And the random dynamic of which of the various units they may bring into battle added an air of mystery to the whole thing. And especially when you're in multiplayer, you choosing what units you're going to use versus what they're going to use can be a game in and of itself. This is a hell of a lot of fun. So as you guys know, I rate games on a buy, wait for sale, rent, or never touch it again rating scale, with rent being replaced by deep, deep sale on PC titles. This is a buy at $19.99. This is one of the most fun RTSs I've played in a long time, and it just works. And it's not super deep, and it's not shallow. It's right in that middle ground, and it has a couple missteps. But the fact is, is that there were times where I was playing this, and it didn't matter who was playing it with me. As we were going through the multiplayer, we were just laughing at what was occurring because it is so great to be able to control easily whatever character you want, but at the same time, see your strategies sort of work out. And then, of course, watch as everybody who's a human player just get annihilated by the ruthless AI. So that's it for me. If you like the video, give it a thumbs up. If you didn't like the video, give it a thumbs up. Not just kidding. You can give it a thumbs down. As always, if you get a chance, check out Patreon or check out Twitter. Following me on Twitter really helps. Doing anything you can on Patreon really helps as well, especially with the consistent demonetization we're getting. And as always, stay tuned to ACG, where you're going to see a ton of reviews in the next couple weeks. Peace out and enjoy the rest of your week.